One thing we can do that is not anything of substance that is important is can I want everybody to speak into your mic and let's make sure each of them works all not at the same time, one at a time. And if there are any that don't work, I'm going to try to see if we can get a hold of one that does. So can we start with the state? Yes, Sean. All right. And I also am going to try to get a longer neck on each of these, um, which might help. But for the meantime, let's just see if it works at all. Mr. Weinstein. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Does that help at all? Did y'all, I don't know that yours works. Pull it towards you some more. Good afternoon. All right. Yeah, you're just gonna have to get it closer. User to you. error, I think, on my part. User error, okay. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Steele, does yours work? Your Honor, is that helpful? I think we've all got to get closer to them. And I can hear, but I've heard that other people can't hear, so. Um, is that okay? That's great. Mr. Sharp. Testing, Your Honor. Great. And then who else is left? Ms. D. Williams. Good afternoon, Your Honor. All right, wonderful. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. And now we have somebody here for everybody as well. So um, let me cross check mics off my list. Okay. Uh, Miss Love, um, was there any evidence you wanted to present or any um, witness you wanted to call with regard to our morning proceedings? Your Honor, given the, um, the scope of what the court has already told us that we were looking into, I don't have any witnesses based on Ms. Bumpus' testimony. And my understanding is that it was Brady material disclosed during the June 10, 2024 hearing in Chambers. Correct. And what she alleges was disclosed is that um, Mr. Copeland said... I know more about the infinity and it has to do with somebody that's not on trial. I'm paraphrasing, but. And so the, the fact that. Hang on a second. Yes. Yes, sir. Mr. Weinstein, you I'm think sorry. there's more to it? I didn't mean to give you side eye, your honor. <laughs> I, 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 uh, yeah, I do believe that there was more that she said that was disclosed other than just the infinity. Okay. What Specifically else? when she said that the state would not prosecute Mr. Copeland for lying except for that one thing, which she said was the murder of Donovan Thomas. I believe that was on the redirect at the very end. With that, yeah. that actually came through more clearly than I think anything else, Your Honor. Okay. Yeah. So, may I respond to that? So, if because that did not, in my mind, amount to Brady. Um, if the court is inquiring into a different issue. Of Hang on just a second. Everybody who's got a phone on you, make sure it is on silent. And you should only have a phone on you if you are an attorney or if you have a rule 22 that permits you to have a phone. Anybody else in here should not have a phone on them at all. If you do, it should be turned completely off. I'm sorry, Your Honor, that was my computer. So okay, I and have the oh, your computer? It. Okay. I silenced it. All right, thank you. So, Miss Love. I was just saying that um, based on the parameters that the court set forth, my understanding was that anything that is alleged to have been said by Miss Hilton in that regard does not impact whether or not Brady material was um, disclosed and, and I'd have a different argument at the appropriate time that the court tells me is the right time to make it. But my, my position would be that given that defense attorneys came to Ms. Bumpus at, within an hour of the meeting before court um, went back in session and asked her, so they had information, they had, the, I assume, the content of whatever it is that they are alleging took place. And then Ms. Bumpus, based on what I heard her say, told them, <laughs> sort of filled in the blanks, I'm using my words, not hers, um, 
and gave to them this information, um, my understanding of what Brady is, is that it is information that is not available to them by any other reasonable means. And they have, obviously, they had someone telling them something about what was going on. So it's not a Brady violation if they had access to it. If there's a different argument, a different issue that we're going to be arguing, I can, I'll, I'll hear that from the court. But as to the Brady violation, my argument is that based on her testimony, there was no Brady violation. Let me add this, Your Honor, too, if I may. Uh, also, the testimony of Mr. Cope, I'm sorry, in the um, off the record meeting where Mr. Copeland. The alleged off the record meeting. The alleged mm -hmm. off the record meeting with Mr. Copeland, to which Ms. Bumpus testified to, where Mr. Copeland allegedly said, I can claim all of this, I can take all of this over and over again. And the all of this was regarding the unliving, the murder of Donovan Thomas. I would submit that Donovan Thomas, I'm sorry, I would submit that Mr. Copeland allegedly saying, I can claim all of this, I can take all of this, would also be Brady material. And Your Honor, again, given that Ms. Bumpus is the person testifying about it today, and that Ms. Bumpus is the person that was approached by members of the defense within an hour of the meeting, that assertion made by her, though I don't agree with counsel's characterization of it, is information that is available to them. But more importantly, Your Honor, I asked Ms. Bumpus specifically what was asked right before. What she said, she understood it to mean Donovan Thomas. But I can claim all of this. My position is that it's not Brady. I can say I can claim it all too. But a hypothetical, I can. What you can do is not saying something that is, that is, all right, I understand your argument. So just for clarification, um, you said I had set parameters as to what is and isn't Brady. And no. I haven't set any parameters as to what is and isn't Brady. Brady is what Brady is. I agree. No, I'm saying you, the parameters that I was speaking of was that you were talking about this hearing is about whether Brady material was disclosed. And my position was that what Ms. Hilton is alleged by Ms. Bumpus to have said to Mr. Copeland would not, I don't think it would amount to Brady, but if it did, I can put up a witness about it. Um, I just didn't think that it was necessary um, unless the unless the court saw it differently than I did. So I guess what I wanted to have us look into is whether what was alleged to have occurred, i.e. an off the record conversation that included, that was between Ms. Bumpus, Mr. Copeland and Ms. Hilton occurred. And then if so, what the substance of it was and whether it contained any Brady. So if you don't want to dispute whether it occurred, that's up to you. I'm not gonna tell you how to run your case, but um, I don't, I mean, I think that's a part of the inquiry as well. So I don't want to mislead you about that. So if you have any evidence that you want to present to dispute whether it occurred or to give us some more, you know, shed some more light on that subject, you're welcome to do that as well. State calls uh, Deputy Chief Investigator Antonio Long. All right. Your Honor, can I um, make a statement before or while um, Investigator Long is taking yes. the uh, witness in? I am specifically uh, objecting to the proffer of Ms. Law, of Ms. Love, always. But in addition, Ms. Love said that me and other people with who represent people who got been accused of these mm -hmm. acts knew already about the ex parte meeting and what occurred and the contents are in, and that is just false. That is just false. That was not testified to by Ms. Bumpkiss. What she said was they knew that a meeting occurred. No one said contents. Actually, my recollection is that I asked her specific, I asked her specifically that question. Did you share 
the um, off the record portions as well and that she said yes she did I agree with that Miss Love said that before meeting with Miss Bumpets that uh, me and other lawyers for people on the defense side knew about what was said at that uh, hearing and that did not happen I, you know that's totally irrelevant so I appreciate it but I, I wouldn't even accept that as any kind of a proffer of hers but um, yes so noted and that's fine um, okay was there anything else with regard to that all right so you said you weren't going to accept a proffer from Miss Love and that's fine you said also Miss Long do you mean investigator Long or Miss Hilton or is there a Miss Long <laughs> oh, Miss Love is who I meant, but I think because Investigator Long has taken the stand, okay. my mind may have been uh, All right. been with him. Okay, and um, with regard to the, just on that topic, the earlier proffer by Miss Love that you objected to and you said on the record, I don't ever accept any proffer from her, and I said that's up to the court, I meant it's up to the court whether to whether I want to hear it or not. But with regard to that, and that was about Mr. Abate, my ruling with regard to that was that's not even relevant if until such point as there might be some other defense motion filed, at which point Miss Love can call Mr. Abate. So, um, okay, so call Investigator Wong. Antonio Long, A N T O N I O, last name Long, L O N G. And Your Honor, before I begin, um, I just wanted to point out that I'd like to just make the record. I know that everyone may be familiar with Deputy Chief Long, but I'd like to ask. The preliminary questions that establish who he, who he is and where he works if, with the court's permission. Okay, that's fine, but he's going to be testifying as an expert, so let's just, you know, cut to the chase to the extent you, he's going to be testifying as an expert right now. He's going to be a fact witness. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, maybe we don't need to go through all of his background. All right. Just um, good afternoon, Deputy Chief Long. Would you tell the court for the record where it is that you work? I work for the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. In what capacity? Deputy Chief Investigator. As Deputy Chief Investigator, are you over any particular units? I am. All right. Are you over the unit that is prosecuting this case that we are here in trial on? I am. And uh, as part of your responsibilities as Deputy Chief Investigator, uh, do you accompany attorneys to meetings with witnesses um, or other attorneys? Yes, I do. Specifically, are you tasked with accompanying um, Deputy District Attorney Hilton and myself when the needs arise? And among other attorneys, yes. On June the 10th, 2024, uh, do you recall that day? I do. And did you accompany myself or Ms. Hilton to the chambers of Chief Judge Glanville on that day. I was with Miss Hilton. Was there anyone accompanying me? Yes. And was that person one of the lieutenants with the DA's office? That's correct. While as Deputy Chief Investigator, do you give instruction to lieutenants and investigators regarding how they are to keep the lawyers in mind and keep their eyes on the lawyers. Yes, I do. I give guidance and counsel in reference to that. And are you all required to remain with us at all times during those types of meetings? Yes. Uh, June 10th of 2024, uh, do you recall who was present in the judge's chambers at the time you arrived with Ms. Hilton? I, I do recall uh, Judge being present, um, court reporter, uh, Ms. Kayla Bumpus, uh, several deputies. Um, and went with Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Copeland, and myself and Ms. Hilton. 
Was I present in Chambers at the time you arrived with Ms. Hilton? Not when Copeland was there, no. Did I ever come back after Copeland arrived in Chambers? You did not. Did you remain with Ms. Hilton during the entire time that she remained in Chambers? I remained with her the entire time she was with Ms. Copeland. Were you present with Ms. Hilton when was Ms. Bumpus in the room during the entire time that Ms. Hilton was in a room with Ms. Copeland? Yes. At any time did Ms. Bumpus leave the room and leave Ms. Hilton in the room with Mr. Copeland without his attorney? No. Were you present in the courtroom today when Ms. Bumpus testified? I was. Did you hear Ms. Bumpus talk about a an off the record conversation that took place between Ms. Bumpus, Ms. Hilton, and Mr. Copeland? I do. Do you recall? During the time that you were in chambers with Ms. Hilton, how many times, if any, that you all went off the record? Make sure I understand your question. How many times did we go off the record? Yes. And let me back up and ask you this. Were you able to um, discern when you all were off the record? Yes. How? When the court reporter was not... Um, documenting what was being taking place. Was there ever a time that you all went off the record at either attorney's request, that is either Ms. Bumpus or Ms. Hilton's? From what I recall, there were times we stepped out of the room so that Ms. Kayla could talk to uh, Mr. Copeland. And then the last time, um, um, there was a conversation before we went back on the record. At any time that you all stepped out of the room so that Ms. Bumpus could speak with Mr. Copeland, did you observe me go into that room? No. Now, when you said there was a conversation that took place the last time, would you please tell the court what you're referring to? The, the conversation I believe Ms. Bumpus is talking about right before we went back on the record. Um, um, there was a conversation where um, Ms. Hilton spoke with uh, Ms. Bumpus um, and Copeland before the judge and the court reporter went back on the record. Did that conversation take place following the time when Ms. Hilton exited the room so that Ms. Bumpus could speak to Mr. Copeland? Or was that a time when you all were sitting in the room and you just went off the record? That was a time where we took a break, and before we came back on break, it happened. If I'm answering your question, if I understand your question. Did you all, you being, you all being, you and Ms. Hilton, did you all leave the room when you say you took a break? Yes, everybody left the room. Okay. Except for Mr. Copeland and the deputies. Okay. Did Ms. Hilton have any contact with Mr. Copeland at, during the time that Ms. Bumpus was not in the room? No. Were you present when, or did you, do you have any memory of Mr. Copeland saying something akin to, I can claim all of this? No. Um, were you within, were you and Ms. Hilton within close practice, within two feet of each other during the entire time that you all were in the in chamber? Yes. Are you able to say, um, whether you all would have been privy to whatever was said. If she heard it, you would have heard it. If you heard it, she would have heard it. Correct. Do you recall speaking with Ms. Bumpus and Mr. Copeland about the Donovan Thomas murder? No. Generally speaking, Starting there, would you tell the court what you recall talking about? I'm, I'm unclear as to when you're talking about starting where. During the time that you were in the in chambers with Ms. Bumpers, Mr. Copeland, and Ms. Hilton, 
can you tell the court the topics that you discussed, that not you, but Ms. Hilton mm -hmm. and Ms. Thomas and Mr. Colton discussed? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the topic at that time, um, uh, Ms. Hilton just made it clear um, to Mr. Copeland that um, um, she expected him to tell the truth and that if he was going to get on the stand and claim something that he know he didn't do, then she would be looking at prosecuting him for perjury. And so I'm clear, is this on the record or off the record that this conversation takes place? This was off the record just before the judge came back in. Have you had an opportunity to read the entire transcript of the in-papers hearing? I have not. <clears throat> Do you recall um, Mr. Copeland making any uh, direct statements about his involvement in the Donovan Thomas murder? He never mentioned anything about the involvement in Donovan Thomas murder. Do you recall him making any uh, indirect statements or statements that could be construed as an involvement in the Donovan Thomas murder? No. Did Ms. Hilton, during her um, conversations with Ms. Copeland, while you, Ms. Bumpus, Mr. Copeland, Ms. Hilton, the court reporter, not the court reporter and the judge, in other words, during an off the record conversation, did Ms. Hilton, oh. hey, back up. So is it your testimony that there was one brief off the record time when Ms. Hilton, Ms. Bumpus, and Mr. Copeland were all in chambers, but before the judge was back in chambers? Or, or just tell me, I, maybe I'm yes, no? Yes, the 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 we broke for someone used the restroom. Okay. And before we went back on the record, that's when uh, Miss Hilton and Kayla had the conversation before uh, uh, Miss Weaver began to record everything. So Miss Weaver was sitting in there. She was not in there at the time they were off the record. Okay. Well, I mean, you can be off the record and still have the court reporter sitting in there. So I'm just trying to no, get clarification. Right so no. this was after a bathroom break. Right. Miss Hilton and Miss Bumpus head back into chambers before the court reporter and the judge are back. Is that right? Well, I want to say Miss Weaver did come in. Um, okay. And then Miss Simone, Miss Hilton did ask. She needed to say something with, with Kayla um, and Mr. Copeland before the judge came back on the record. And... Mr. Copeland's in there at that point Mr. in Copeland time. Mr. Copeland was in there. All right, and say what is the substance of that very brief two minute or whatever conversation? It was Ms. Hilton explaining to Mr. Copeland that if he did get on the stand and take credit or try to take credit for something he didn't do, she would then seek prosecution for perjury. She would? Seek prosecution for perjury. And did she talk with any specificity about what crime or crimes that would include? She she did mention um, um, uh, the Donovan Thomas um, uh, case and that if you got him claim something that he knows he didn't do and we prove, have proof that he didn't do, then she would prosecute for perjury. All right, and so your recollection is that that conversation occurred off the record before the judge was in there? Yes. Okay. Do you have a recollection of a very similar conversation also occurring on the record? No. So if it's reflected on the record, then that's the conversation that occurred? Say that one more time, Judge. Were there two very similar conversations about that where Ms. Hilton is saying, if you get up and say something that we know you didn't do, we're going to prosecute you for, or we or I am going to prosecute you for perjury? She, she, the, during the course of the, the conversation, um, Mr. Copeland's concern appeared to be his statements or inconsistent statements. Uh-huh. I'm talking about just the off the record now. 
just off the record was just in reference to him taking responsibility for something that he didn't do. Okay. I have no idea why that phone is ringing or how to turn it off. This is not my courtroom, so we're just going to ignore it. Um, that phone being the desk phone on the bench for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> um, okay, sorry about that interruption. Um, all right, and you only recall one conversation about that, whether it occurred on or off the record? I only recall one conversation specifically in reference to Ms. Hilton saying that she would seek perjury um, unless it was some blatant or blatant lie. She would or she would not? She would not unless it was a blatant lie. She wasn't concerned about inconsistencies that she would use impeach. She would just impeach him for inconsistencies. Okay. So do you recall any conversation where... Ms. Hilton says, and this is on or off the record, Ms. Hilton essentially says, look, if you get up there and you claim something, that you're the one that did something, and I flat out know you didn't do it, I'm not going to prosecute you for perjury for that because I don't know what your reasons might be. I don't recall a conversation to that. I, I do know that she... She used an example that she would have to corroborate something before she prosecute. Okay. All right. So the extent of the off the record before the court got back in their conversation um, was her essentially just saying, what? I, I, her, her conversation was in reference to him getting on the stand and taking responsibility for something that he know that he didn't do or falsely admitting to something that he did after receiving use immunity. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Love. Thank you, Judge. Did Ms. Hilton attempt or did she make any effort to explain perjury beyond what you just described for the court? Do you remember her doing that? Doing this off the record or just in general? In general? Yes, she did. Was the conversation that you are relating to the court that happened off the record, um, was it, did it contain, did it, did it refer to matters that you later discussed on the record as well or not? <laughs> All of it in sense was stuff that per se was explained on the record. It was just clarifying what would constitute uh, perjury versus inconsistent statements or what she would need to impeach him. And showing you, for instance, just page 50 of the transcript line. conversation that took place off the record that you were just describing for the court. And by that, I'm talking about um, where Ms. Hilton is saying that's different, referring to the word purge. And Mr. Copeland says that can get me back in jail. And Ms. Hilton says yes. And Ms. Hilton in line 24, page 50 says, it's not what you're saying. It's not what it's not. What you're saying is not perjury. What you're saying is what we call a prior inconsistent statement and so forth and so on. Is that the type of conversation that took place off the record? Objection, lady. Sustained. Yeah. It, it, it. Sustained. Ask a different question. Yes, John. During the conversation off the record, did Ms. Hilton endeavor at any time to um, help Mr. Coleman understand the difference between perjury and purge. If you remember. I, I don't remember if that was substance of the off the record. Um, I do know during the course of, of the meeting, um, she repeated that several times, trying to explain the difference between purge and perjury. 
and off the record, the comments, any comments that, were the comments that Ms. Hilton made regarding hypothetical instances where perjury could be occurring. Does she clarify for Mr. Copeland in any way, does she seek to clarify how she would be able to distinguish between perjury and something that wasn't perjury? Objection made. Overruled. Um, the, the off the record conversation was very brief and very short. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of explanations because that had already taken place. Do you remember anything that Mr. Copeland said in response to what Ms. Hilton said about being able to, if, if he got up on the stand and admitted something that she could prove he was lying about? Yeah. Is this you asking during the off the record conversation? Yes. Okay. He said he wasn't going to do that. And what is it that he said he wasn't going to do? Get on the stand and, and lie for something he didn't do. Did, do you have memory of him asking or stating something about not going to say that he killed Donovan Thomas? He, he didn't use those, that word. He said he wasn't going to take credit or say he did something he didn't do. Yeah. Do you recall if those words you just spoke were um, in response to a question about the murder of Donovan Thomas? It wasn't a question of, uh, specifically about Donovan Thomas. It was a question about him getting on the stand. It was a statement about him getting on the stand and taking credit for something he didn't do. And broadly, do you recall Ms. Hilton um, making, making comments about Donovan Thomas that Mr. Copeland didn't make any comments? About. Other than um, if he got on the stand and 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 took credit for something or or said he did something that he know he didn't do and we knew he didn't do, um, that was the only statement she made and that he said he wasn't going to get on the stand to do that. Now about a, do you have any memory of Mr. Copeland either on the record or off the record saying anything about a great infinity that the state about having information about the infinity that the state doesn't know. They never said anything about the infinity to, to me or Ms. Simone, Ms. Hilton. Did you ever in, in endeavor to find out what he may have told Ms. Bumpus Proctor? I want you to reveal if you heard it. I just want you to know one of no. if you ever endeavor to find out what he may have said to her No. Would it have stood out in your mind if Copeland had uh, made any kind of inculpatory remarks <clears throat> about the murder of Donovan Thomas? Almost definitely. If, if he had a made remark about the murder of Donovan Thomas, then we would initiate an investigation. And I would assign one of those lieutenants to assist me with looking into that. Do you have any memory of any exculpatory, thank you, exculpatory remarks Mr. Copeland made about any defendant currently on trial or not on trial? <clears throat> regarding the Donovan Thomas murder? No. Your Honor, I'm, I'm Go ahead. The floor. That's okay. fine. All right. Does your memory of what took place during any portions of the uh, conversation that were off the record, does your memory align with what you heard Ms. Bumpus testify about regarding off the record conversations? The restroom break, just, just the restroom break. And what about the content of the off the record conversations? Does your memory align with what her memory is as she testified about? Not for the majority of it, no. Would you tell the court any um, discrepancies between what you recall and what you heard she, that she recalls? Um, the off the record, like I said before, um, basically uh, uh, Ms. Hilton having the conversation about um, Mr. Copeland getting on the stand and taking uh, credit or claiming something that he didn't do and that we know he didn't do. 
Um, that was in, in just the gist of the off the record uh, conversation before the judge came back in. And what, if anything, did you hear Ms. Pompas talk about that you have no memory of whatsoever or that you can testify in your revelation did not happen? Um, the incident about the infinity, um, him claiming that um, I can claim all of this. Um, 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 the part about you coming back the second time, um, um, those are, those that's what stands out to me right now. And was my absence from the convo from the uh, interactions between Ms. Hilton and um, Mr. Scratch that. Uh, Your Honor, that's all the questions. All right. Thank you. Um, anybody from the defense side have questions for Investigator Wong? <laughs> Miss Love, do you need a call drop? Because I actually have so many big ones. It's good. Okay. Investigator Long, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I want to talk to you specifically about the off the record portion of the meeting on June 10th, 2024. Okay. Okay. All right. And if, if I have it mixed up, what's off was off the record versus on the record, just correct me. I'm, I'm trying to understand myself. Okay. So, right. um, first of all, the off the record um, portion of this ex parte meeting, you said that Miss Weaver, the court reporter, did come in um, to the judge's chambers, the judge's back room and chambers during that discussion, correct? Everybody was coming in initially. Okay. And that was before what we're deeming the off the record conversation, right. correct? And Ms. Hilton specifically requested Ms. Weaver not to take to take that those communications down, correct? I, I wouldn't say she directed Ms. Hilton, I mean Ms. Weaver, but she did say she wanted to talk to Ms. Bumpus before we went back on the record. She made the request, Ms. Yes. Hilton. Okay, and that was to remain off the record was requested by Ms. Hilton and Ms. Hilton alone. Yes, sir. Okay. Can I get a little clarification there? So this is after the restroom break, right? Or whatever kind of break it was? Yes, Judge. Okay, and um, when Ms. Hilton said, I want to speak off the record to Ms. Bumpus for a minute, was Judge Glanville already in that room by then or not? He, he had stepped in and then ended up stepping back out. Okay, and so, all right, yeah. thank you. And um, you indicated that during this off the record portion, um, Ms. Hilton said, stated to Mr. Copeland uh, that she would not pursue perjury charges unless it was a blatant lie. That, that was said during the off the record portion, correct? No, that's not what I testified to. Okay, when was that statement? I don't ever recall her to saying that she wouldn't see charges unless it was a blatant lie. Okay. I think she was trying to explain um, the difference between the inconsistent statement and then a a, a uh, uh, outright lie, if I can use that terminology. Well, what, what, what did she say? Um, what do you mean what you said? Well, you said that when I said she would not pursue perjury unless it was a blatant lie, you said that was not what she said. So what did she say regarding that? And off the record? Yes. Yeah. Uh, her statement or comment to uh, Mr. Copeland was that uh, if you did get on the stand and you uh, took claim or took credit, just me paraphrasing, paraphrasing um, for something that you did, um, then um, uh, knowing that you didn't, knowing we know you didn't do it, then she would see uh, perjury charges for that. Okay. 
And you indicated, my understanding of your testimony is you indicated that at some point, Ms. Hilton specifically referred to getting on the stand and claiming responsibility for the Donovan Thomas situation. Is that correct? Yeah, if, if, if he took credit for something he didn't do, yes. But specifically, it was stated the Donovan Thomas situation, correct? Yes. Okay, and that was out of Ms. Hilton's mouth? Yes. Okay, so Ms. Hilton specifically, during the off-the-record portion, referenced Mr. Copeland taking credit or taking responsibility for the killing of Donovan Thomas. Yeah, I, it didn't come exactly like that, but yes, it, it just, yes. And Ms. Hilton specifically said that if Mr. Copeland did that, she would seek perjury charges against Mr. Copeland, correct? If, if he got up and, and he, he, he took credit for something he knew and he didn't do, yes. Well, you, you, you keep going back to you know you didn't do, but in the, the fact is in that off the record portion of the conversation, it wasn't just generally something we know you didn't do. She specifically said- It was both. Killing, okay, so it was specifically something we know you didn't do. And then she also said specifically right. for claim responsibility killing of Donovan Thomas. Okay, so to your recollection, if you recall, prior to Ms. Hilton, did Ms. Hilton just bring Donovan Thomas that case into the discussion or did Mr. Copeland say something that Ms. Hilton was responding to when she said, when she warned him not to take credit for the Donovan Thomas killing? Ask the question one more time. What did Mr. Copeland say before then that prompted Ms. Hilton to start talking about Donovan Thomas' murder? Mr. Copeland didn't, didn't say anything. Um, um, I, I can only, um, I believe Ms. Hilton was, was attempting to just explain, uh, because he had, uh, received use immunity, uh, not to go in and try to claim something, um, that he didn't do because he received use immunity. So your testimony is Mr. Copeland didn't bring up Donovan Thomas, but Ms. Hilton brought up Donovan, the dominant Donovan Thomas murder. Right. Did Ms. Bumpus bring up the Donovan Thomas murder prior to that? Not that I recall, no. And how was it determined when, uh, Ms. Weaver was going to start making a record of this meeting again? I don't know how it was determined. Did someone call her in? Did, did someone ask her to start recording now or taking minutes now? Yeah, I believe if you're asking what, what made her prompted to, yeah, yes. yeah, we, we said, uh, um, I don't, I don't recall if it was Ms. Hilton, but Ms. Hilton may have said we're, we're finished talking. And we called everybody back in. And instructed the meeting to go back on the record? Instructed that the meeting should I, go back I don't on the record? We instructed, but we were clear to go back on the record. Okay. I have no further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Are you, sir? How you doing, Mr. Steele? I'm okay. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm blessed and out of favor. Can I uh, ask you a couple of questions? Yes. Um, what was your understanding, if you had one, of why you were having this ex parte meeting? Objection, Howard. Sustained. <clears throat> what, well, at what point were you initially told that you're going to this ex parte meeting? Objection, Howard. I want to know which party was there for it. But the game part, he said he stayed with you, came with Miss Hilton. I want to clarify. Ask your question again. At what point did you become aware that you're going to this ex parte meeting? I'll allow that. Uh, I believe that morning. And when you say that morning, um, was it before the meeting began? Do you know when the meeting began? It was before. Okay. It was before the meeting. And who alerted you that? Um, 
Miss Hilton, I believe. You know, because of course we had to escort him off to the to the judge chambers. And was it? Did you escort? When you say them, who did you escort? Who did you escort? <laughs> say one more time. Miss Hilton. And was um, um, Adrian Love already there in the meeting, or did she come with you or go after you? Um, she was already there. All right. Now, how often, besides this day? Have you had these type of meetings with Judge Glanville? With me, uh, just this one. How about with other people that you know about? With Judge Glanville, no. Never happened with Judge Glanville. Well, in this case? Just this one. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else from the defense? Oh, I have one other Go ahead. Did anybody tell you that that was um, not to be told to other people who are not invited to that meeting? What's the relevance of that? The state of Georgia, I objected to it, made a statement that I somehow knew about this beforehand, which is not true. So I want to ask if anybody directed anybody to tell any tell somebody from the defense, not tell anybody from the defense. I'll find what. You know, I, I never. I did not represent to the court. That's fine. It's all right. Um, I'm going to allow the question. No. If I understand you correctly, you didn't want to tell me not to say anything. What, one more time, you spoke very fast. I'm sorry. What, what's your question? Did anyone want to tell me not to say anything about this meeting? Yeah. No. Did you tell anybody about the meeting? Did you personally tell anybody, um, me, any of the other defense lawyers, any of the people accused of this meeting? No. Thank you, Bill. Mr. Matthews, while well, Mr. Matthews is making his way over, um, what is your recollection as to sort of when during the meeting, like within the first 10 minutes, within the last 10 minutes, right in the middle, if you recall that the bathroom break and then short off the record conversation occurred that you testified to? This was near the end. Near the end? Near okay. The end. All right. Good afternoon. How are you today? Thanks, Matt. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Just a couple of questions. Did you have any recording devices uh, in the uh, in the meeting yourself? No. Did you make any written notes of any of the meeting yourself? No. Okay. And just for the the record for today, uh, you were actually in the courtroom during the time that Kayla was te Kayla Bumpus was testifying uh, before this honorable court, correct? That's correct. Right. Okay. Did you know this morning before? Uh, court that you might be testifying about this matter today? I did not know. Okay. I, I could ponder, but I did not know. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Uh, any redirect? <clears throat> when you spoke about the comment that Ms. Hilton made of about claiming something that he didn't do or the Donovan Thomas murder. Does she qualify her comments in any way? What do you mean by qualify? Did I hear, um, did she tack on anything about if she could or couldn't prove it? Or did she just say, if you do this, I will charge you with perjury? She, she consistently, if she's mentioned charge, she would say that she would have to cooperate anything before, before we charge. But um, she did uh, mention the fact of, of um, I, I can only speculate, I just use the word, um, the concern about him trying to take claim for something after receiving free use of it. And were those comments that she made that you're talking about also accompanied by any kind of explanation, like if I can prove it or? Yeah, because she, she mentioned the fact of um, if we knew and we know you didn't do it. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Anything else from the defense? All right, is, um, is the transcript before the witness at this point? I don't know where it went to. Yes, yeah. Okay, can you flip to page 41 and um, take a look at, well, the end of 40 starting at line 20 and then review that through the rest of line, or the rest of page 41. All right. Is it a fair characterization that during that portion of the meeting, uh, Ms. Hilton, uh, Ms. Bumpus, and Mr. Copeland are talking about what might or might not get him charged with perjury or false statements? Yes. And um, does Mr. Copeland raise um, the issue of murder and whether it has a statute of limitations? Yes. Okay. And does Ms. Hilton at some point after that... Um, talk about if she knows that he's lying about something and um, she there's no other evidence um, what that might or might not result in. Yes. All right. Do you recall whether the off the record post bathroom break conversation occurred before or after this on the record conversation? Give me just a second and look a little past just to make sure. Sure. take a look at the entire rest of the transcript, do you think you might be able to figure out about when that break and off the record conversation happened? I will take a look. And I mean, you may or might not be able to, but if you can, let me know. If you can't, let me know that as well.
Page 52. Can you find out whether that's somebody who has a rule 22? And if it is not, they cannot come back in with that phone. Thank you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. No problem. Ron, I believe 52, uh, around 13, 14. Okay. When we come back in, um, yeah, I think somewhere around in there. Okay. And, and a break is actually indicated at lines 9 through 13 or so. Is right. that right? Okay. Right. And then at line 14, the court remarks, Mr. Clopin, have you had an opportunity to talk with Ms. Bumpus, your lawyer, and Ms. Hilton, the state's counsel? Have you got any other questions? Yeah, so it's right the before that that the off the record conversation occurred okay thank you all right any other questions by any counsel defense counsel all right anybody else silence equals none okay Ms. love anything yes your honor thank you chief uh deputy chief long on page 40 lines 20 through 25 when the court <coughs> refers to comments made to Mr. Copeland earlier by Ms. Love. Did you ever hear those types of comments um, made by Ms. Hilton? Yeah, Ms. Hilton. Yeah. Was there any time you are aware of that Chief Deputy Love, myself, would have been in a position to make those comments to Mr. Copeland that morning? No, not with Copeland in the room. You, you weren't around at all. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Okay. All right. Investigator, thank you. You may step down. Any other evidence, Ms. Love? Um, not about, um, no, Your Honor, not, okay. not at this time. All right. Any rebuttal evidence from anybody on the defense side of the room? All right. Anything y'all want to suggest that this actually means? There's a case that I believe that Mr. Steele has shared with you. I'm trying to get this site right now. Um, Ford Motor Company B versus Young, 322 Georgia Appeals, 348. And um, that case deals, that, that case, when we've been discussing this in the past, there's been mm -hmm. suggestions that um, if there was judicial misconduct or what we th believe is judicial misconduct from this side of the room, or if there was pro prosecutorial misconduct or what we perceive to be prosecutorial misconduct from this side of the room, um, that the remedy was with the bar. And that case, the, the Ford case, indicates to me that your honor and the trial court 
can play an active role in fashioning remedies um, in the case of judicial misconduct and or prosecutorial misconduct. I don't know about judicial misconduct. That's not what that case stands for. Prosecutorial misconduct okay. or, or lawyer misconduct, I should say. Violations of the state bar rules. Yes. Can I go get one thing for myself? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I filed a motion on Friday. Yes, I worked diligently over the weekend on writing an order with regard to that motion. I haven't gotten to the Brady portion of it yet. So, and I appreciate that, Your Honor. I appreciate the attention that you've given it. Um, my, that motion in the beginning, it lays out things that I've observed that I've felt have been highly irregular about this case. The point of my my inclusion of that in my motion was not to draw extra attention to it or for anyone to feel sorry for me or anything else, because it's really about my client, Mr. Stilwell. But the purpose of it was to try to inform the court, at least from my perspective, and I think the perspective of some of my colleagues, that things have been irregular in this case. And, um, and that there are real life consequences and consequences to the trial when we perceive, um, what we believe is, um, the lack of an impartial trial judge and also of prosecutorial misconduct. In this case, um, from my perspective, we've had with the ex parte communications in themselves, I don't believe that there was a valid reason to initiate the meetings. Um, I believe that the state and members of the state's prosecution team in particular took something very small and jumped to unbelievable conclusions um, as a way to get themselves, get their foot in the door of the judges' chambers to have a discussion. And there were at least two discussions that took place. I'm assuming that there was a third discussion, which may have strictly involved the grant of immunity. Um, All right, but, well, right. To, I think we cleared that up on Friday because we specifically asked, was there any hearing or any kind of ex parte, anything with regard to getting the order or was it just the motion being filed? So right. I, I don't have any reason to believe there's yet another one, but. Right, and, and you know, there's, there's a potential under the King case that that one, if it was just for the purposes of granting immunity, may have been a proper ex parte, but these were not. These, the substance of these meetings exceeded what is appropriate. They violated uh, Uniform Superior Court, Court Rule 4.1, which says that judges shall neither initiate nor consider ex parte communications by interested parties or their attorneys concerning a pending or impending proceeding. Um, judicial, Georgia Code of Judicial Conduct Rule 2.9 uh, prohibits ex parte meetings except for a narrow exception. Scheduling administrative purposes or emergencies that do not deal with substantive matters or issues on the merits. Provided that, so we don't believe that it falls under an exception to begin with, um, provided that the judge reasonably believes that no party will gain a procedural, substantive, or tactical advantage as a result of the ex parte communication. In, in, in my view, the transcript reveals open discussions about you're going to testify, you can say you don't recall. They're basically walking through the, 
the procedures for uh, laying the foundation for prior inconsistent statements. To say that that doesn't put that, that meeting with just the judge and the witness who has been sworn in doesn't put the state at a tactical advantage over the defense who's excluded, I don't believe that to be the case. Secondly, uh, even if it falls under the exception, um, the judge must make pr provision to promptly not notify mm -hmm. and give the parties the substance of the ex parte communication mm -hmm. and an opportunity to respond. Um, we were not promptly notified. We found out through, I keep saying dogness and happenstance. Um, I believe that's what it was. We learned about it. And then when we asked for an opportunity to respond, we were promptly greeted with an invitation to go to the jail for 20 days. Um, so that was violated. The George, Georgia rule of professional responsibility rule 4.2, um, regarding communications with a person represented by counsel. The state, it's the worst kept secret in this courtroom that John Melnick represents Kenneth Copeland. Worst kept secret. Everyone knew that. I knew that, and that's why I called Mr. Co Mr. Melnick. Okay. The state is somehow claiming that in this case where the world is watching, it's a huge case that they did not know that Mr. Melnick was representing Kenneth Copeland and they went behind uh, Mr. Melnick's back and initiated conversations with Mr. Copeland. Um, in, let's, and, and let's be frank, all these gentlemen are facing RICO charges from with uh, overt acts going back to 2013. So this is not a case where Mr. Copeland could not possibly be prosecuted. He could easily be indicted. He could easily be indicted and put with the, the rest of the gentlemen who were severed off of this case and be in Rice Street right now. He was in legal jeopardy uh, when the state was seeking to speak to him outside the presence of his attorney. From our perspective, that was a knowing violation of professional Georgia rule of professional responsibility 4.2. Additionally, Your Honor, um, there's bar rule 3.3, candor towards a tribunal. Now I can't flesh this out without Miss Love taking the stand. I would love to ask her about it, but in the motion for uh, to grant Mr. Copeland immunity, in paragraph 12, I believe it is, they specifically stated that a member of the defense team had contact with Mr. Copeland and that prompted him to begin to assert that he was going to um, exercise his Fifth Amendment right. Uh, uh, I, I, I would prefer that since there continue to be allegations back and forth amongst the lawyers that we specifically get what is actually stated in there instead of, and I know you're not trying to misrepresent anything, you're trying to give it your best recollection, but let's get the actual motion and read the actual words, okay? I've got it somewhere. Okay, I've, I've, I've got it right here, Your Honor, from uh, Ms. Bursfield's email to us. trying to find out exactly, try to figure out where it was. Okay, paragraph 11, I'm sorry. Paragraph 11. Mm -hmm. Yes, it says, Kenneth Copeland has been subpoenaed to testify in the above style case. Copeland is the ne next witness scheduled to testify in this case on June 7, 2024, <laughs> beginning at nine o'clock a.m. 
On June 4th, 2024, and June 5th, 2024, investigators with the offices of Fulton County District Attorney coordinated and arranged with Kenneth Copeland to provide Copeland transportation to court on Friday, June 7th, 2024. However, on Thursday, June 6, 2024, after an encounter with defense team members and members of the Fulton County District Attorney's Office, Copeland stated to an investigator and to an attorney with the office of the Fulton County District Attorney that Copeland may attempt to plead the fifth to avoid testifying against members of YSL. I can only speak for myself. I did not have any encounters with Mr. Copeland on June 6, 2024. I don't believe that any of my colleagues did. I don't believe any members of the defense team did. I don't believe that what's asserted in paragraph 11 to my knowledge, I don't believe it to be the truth. Um, if it is not the truth, and again, I would love to inquire, but um, Ms. Love would be a witness at that point. Um, bar Rule 3.3, .3, candor towards the tribunal would also have been violated. The reason I focus on the, the violation of these rules is because of the Ford case. Um, and the proposition that we can do something about this besides run to the bar. And that makes sense because it's ultimately the if, and I say it did happen, but, and I say the transcript establishes that it did happen. And you have the transcript, Your Honor. We have in the transcript the state and Judge Glanville, both asserting, both affirming each other that Mr. Copeland can essentially be incarcerated indefinitely until this trial is over, until the trial of the co-defendants is over. That, to me, is coercion. That's intimidation. We have um, other examples where Mr. Copeland is given what I would say incorrect legal advice about what his exposure is um, for these for these allegations and his potential um, criminal liability. That is coercion that's that's trying to convince him to take the stand and plead so that the state can then impeach him with his prior inconsistent statements, presumably. Mr. Copeland, the act of him taking the stand as a result of those ex parte communications has prejudiced, has harmed all of these young men in court here today. So there has to be relief beyond okay. bar issues for them. Um, Your Honor, I'm not going to repeat everything in my motion. You have my motion. I know you've read my motion. But they have a right to a trial, they have due process rights. They have a right to a trial free of prosecutorial misconduct if that misconduct raises, rises to the level of a due process violation. They have an absolute right to a fair trial and due process in front of a fair and impartial uh, trial judge. They also have the right to be present at all critical stages of the proceedings, including, I'm saying, and I think it's fairly clear that those ex parte communications, um, talking about the witness uh, under the Scudder case that I provided to the court before, that that was a critical stage and they were unlawfully excluded. And of course, there's no way we could have acquiesced because we knew nothing about it ourselves. So those are all violations that have harmed these individuals. There has to be a remedy. I believe that the facts are there for you to consider disqualification of, of district attorneys in this case. Um, and I think Mr. Steele is going to argue that further. But also, I believe that the facts are there under the Wilson case, as well as the... State v. Jackson 
306 Georgia 626, Anderson v. State 285 Georgia Appeals 166, and Wilson v. State 233 Georgia Appeals 327. Wilson v. State 233 Georgia Appeals 327. All right, and those are the three cases that y'all gave me a Correct. couple of days About ago. Going yeah. in. And, and the reason I, I cite to those cases, because it's not often, well, it would be never probably, that it, a district attorney or prosecutor is going to say, yes, I did this intentionally, I did this to go. These cases looked at the egregiousness of the violation the experience of the prosecutors involved. Ms. Love is a chief deputy district attorney in the office, head of the unit of the unit all right. that deals. Can I interrupt you for just a minute? So all of this is in your motion, and if and when we get to that point, that would okay. be an appropriate argument. But let's okay. Well, that you pause asked, it for now. I have it. You asked what where we are right now. And that's, that's from my perspective, okay. that's where we are right now. All right. And I don't, I don't mean you can't argue anymore. I just no, mean I the, the information about their qualifications is in your position. Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and if Mr. Steele's going to argue as to something else, that's fine. Um, but um, I had said a little while earlier that with regard to Ms. Love, your um, proffer, about what Mr. Abadi might or might not have to say about Mr. Melnick's representation was not yet relevant. I think it is now relevant and the proffer has not been accepted. So if you want to present evidence as to that, that would now be appropriate. Thank I don't, you. And I don't mean this very instant because I'm going to hear from Mr. Steele, but we now know that is an issue. So you can go ahead and get him lined up. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Mr. Steele. Your Honor, I would just like the court to consider the case that was announced to the Son of a Court by Attorney Shard. I emailed it earlier today to your Honorable Court's co-worker and all the parties. It's Ford Motor Company versus Young, and it was 322 Georgia Appeal, 348, it's in Division 3. 745 Southeast 2D 299 2013 case. And what our second highest court wrote was, and I've given a copy actually to this court. And, uh, oh, yeah, I, I got the copy. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's, it's on page eight of nine of the copy I've given. It's on the right hand side, first full paragraph. And it specifically states that in the center, and we have previously held that trial courts may disqualify attorneys for violations of the disciplinary rules. We held that the trial court erred in ruling that because sanctions for violations of disciplinary rules appear to be the exclusive province of the Supreme Court of Georgia, not of the trial court. It lacked authority to determine whether plaintiff's counsel violated 4.2, rule 4.2 of the Georgia Rules of Professional Conduct and therefore should be disqualified. We noted that the determination of whether an attorney should be disqualified from representation, from representing a client in a judicial proceeding rests in the sound discretion of the trial judge. So I'd just like you to reconsider your order, um, not disqualifying Ms. Hilton and Ms. Love. And you've inherited a case that has a lot of um, has a lot of history and a lot of it bad. And I put into my motion, I could go over with the court and I also attached the uh, YouTube links. It's on um, July 10th, 2024. I also filed a in case the link goes away. I filed on a thumb drive to preserve it. So um, that's with the clerk's office and a copy was sent to the uh, 
prosecution as well. But it started before, but, you know, an opening statement. I don't know if you, you you've yeah, read I, it. So. I read your motion and I looked at the portions that you were talking about. Hurtful. You know, it's hurtful. And then as of last week, a new court comes on. It's almost like, you know, a breath of fresh air. It's, it's all new. And again, I'm hit with a motion by Miss Love that was the fourth time the same things argued. It's talking about a duty mm -hmm. that is intentionally and knowingly um, not followed through by me. And I owe it to her. And I saw your email saying, whoever wrote that, you come into court. I, I yeah. understood it. I don't think Miss Love did herself any favors with that. Well, the, the favors have to end. You know, it, it's, I'm not trying to, I've never done this before in my history of living in a courtroom, but it's just not appropriate that I can't accept a proffer from a lawyer. I've never said that before. I've never uttered any of those words. So I'll leave it with you. My point is it doesn't end. There, there have been no sanctions. It's been ratified almost. And, and it's from everything. It's just, it's just, I put in paragraph two, just choice examples from my memory. But it is constant. You know, there are great people everywhere in the courts and they shouldn't be treated like this. So that's my, I'm actually disqualified because it's just not, at some point, it's it, the message needs to be sent that this is not the state of Georgia and this is not our bar. All right. Thank you. Um, as I understood the gravamen of your um, motion that you filed since I've been the, the presiding judge to disqualify uh, Ms. Love and Ms. Hilton, it was because you needed them as a witness. And that was the basis of my ruling. And um, in Mr. Sharp's motion that is under consideration right now is a request, again, to disqualify them. And I know that I previously said Y'all, that's a matter for the bar. And when I was talking about that, I essentially meant the, um, and I don't want to call it bickering back and forth because I'm not sure it's been back and forth to any large extent, but that kind of thing, the whatever it is that, that had been talked about before, that's what I was talking about. I will tell you that this court takes Brady violations very seriously. And I mean, everybody ought to, um, prosecutors ought to. And I am considering that right now. Um, so rest assured that I am aware and have been aware that I have the authority if I choose to remove them. Thank you. So, all right. Do you want to be heard from the state on this? Or, or and or do you want to go ahead and um, present some testimony we to do. counter the Melnick, um, you know, that, that you knowingly contacted um, Mr. Copeland, knowing he was represented by Mr. Melnick? Absolutely, Your Honor. All right. What we did was ask that our witnesses be summoned, if you will. Okay. If the court would right. just give us a Sure. Why don't we take a convenience break and can can you let a deputy know when you're ready with somebody and we'll come back up. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.